Absolutely great. Hi, everybody. I'm really happy to be able to speak with Master Gardeners today. This is one of, uh, you all are one of my favorite audiences because um, everyone's always so enthusiastic. I regret I can't be there with you because I love having an um, on a sort of participation with the audience, which of course we can't do in a webinar, but uh, this is better than nothing. So uh, anyway, today I'll be talking to you about healthy soil. And uh, this is actually the first of three webinars that I'll be giving for the Master Gardeners. The next one is about um, regenerative gardening. And then um, the final one will be on regenerative landscaping. So hopefully I'll be, we'll be able to tune into those. So uh, let's get going and talk about soil. Um, let me see, I just need to move something. Let's talk about what the um, North America was like before the Europeans came. Um, most of Eastern North America was covered with virgin forest, uh, gigantic trees, um, and all kinds of understory stuff. Um, this is a picture from the Joyce Kilmer National Forest in North Carolina, and if you have never been there, I haven't been there in maybe 25 years, but um, it's, it's got the most amazing trees ever. Um, and there's virtually no virgin forest left in um, anywhere in the Eastern uh, US anyway, um, I think other than this one little piece. The Midwest and the grassland area was covered with uh, prairie like this, um, can be either grassy, sometimes there's, there's uh, blooming things in there. Um, and the point about bringing this up is that when we um, had a landscape covered with forest and prairie, um, the soil was basically at peak health. Um, all, both of these kinds of landscapes have lots and lots of organic matter because there's leaves falling down or there's dead, dead um, grasses. And this just builds and builds and builds up the organic matter in the soil, which means that um, there's really good soil structure. Um, obviously, there's, there's deep roots in both um, grasslands and in forests. When you have good soil structure, you have great water infiltration and the soil purifies the water. So you have really good water quality. And in these kinds of native landscapes, flooding and erosion are rare, um, unless you just get a gigantic, well, I don't even know whether um, even with a gigantic storm, you would see a lot of flooding because the infiltration of water is, is huge in these settings. And also there is very, very high biodiversity in the soil in both the forests and the grasslands. So what we had um, before the Europeans showed up was basically a soil ecosystem and above ground ecosystem that was in really good balance. Then came the Europeans and they started farming. Um, so I'll just tell you a little bit about what the Europeans that began to farm in the Midwest encountered. Um, they found a really, really deep and very, very rich topsoil that had been built up by the roots of these prairie plants. Um, and I'll just explain this picture uh, because it's not every day you see a guy standing next to a, <laughs> a big bunch of prairie plants and roots. But this is Jerry Glover. Uh, he used to work with the Land Institute in Kansas where he spent many years um, uh, breeding perennial grains. Okay, most grains, as you know, are annuals because they put all their energy into the actual seeds. But perennial grains have deep roots and would really be um, environmentally beneficial. Anyway, he wanted to know what the roots of prairie plants look like. So just sort of put yourself in his shoes for a second. How are you ever going to see the roots of prairie plants? Because they go down many, many, many feet. They're under the ground. You cannot dig them up, okay? Imagine starting here at the surface with a shovel. You're not going to dig this up. You might get maybe a foot down, but you're not going to see the whole structure. So what Jerry Glover did was he got a bunch of 55-gallon drums and cut the ends off and stacked them up and filled them up with a very loose um, soil and planted these native plants, uh, compass plant, uh, big blue stem, and Indian grass, two of the two of the largest native grasses, and um, let it go for a while. And then he um, essentially disassembled the drums, took the drums off, and shook off this loose soil. And he had this gigantic mass of roots. And so you can see 
uh, well, he's like six foot two or something, right? And so um, the roots go probably around 10 feet. The roots of compass plants can grow um, as deep as 15 feet. Uh, he probably didn't let them go that long. But you can see the volume of the root matter, um, sort of in the shape of a 55-gallon drum. <laughs> Looks like it pretty much filled up the space for maybe the first two drums, um, and then uh, it petered out toward the bottom. But the point is, the prairie plants had these gigantic, very thick roots, very deep roots. There was a mixture of plants, so they filled up all of the space. Um, below ground uh, down to quite a deep depth. And then when the uh, individual roots die, they leave a little organic matter down there. They leave channels for other roots to grow through. Um, and this just creates a very, very deep, deep topsoil. So um, in many places in the Midwest where the Europeans um, the sod busters came and began to uh, clear the sod and do agriculture, the topsoil was over four feet deep. And so they thought, wow, you know, wow, this is better than anything they'd ever seen in, in Europe. And it just seemed endless. And like many things that seem endless, they weren't very careful with it. And now after around 150 years, in most places, it's maybe six to eight inches deep, maybe less in some places. So most of this soil, topsoil has been lost to erosion um, uh, after the advent of agriculture. And more than half of the total organic matter of North American soil is gone after 150 years. And um, you know, where did it go, you're asking? It went into the nearest waterways through erosion down the Mississippi, and it built the Louisiana Delta. So <laughs> if you wanna know where the Louisiana Delta came from, it came from Iowa um, uh, and, and other parts on the Mississippi drainage. Okay, so by the 1930s, um, this had the sort of agriculture without any real clear understanding of how soil and water interact. This just use of this amazing resource, the, the soil from the prairies, um, basically ended in tragedy with the Dust Bowl, which was a major wake-up call about unsustainable behavior. It's not the last wake-up call we've gotten, we've, we, we've done a lot of unsustainable behavior, not just in agriculture, but this, I think, made a huge impact, okay? Uh, I doubt any of us on this call were alive uh, when the Dust Bowl was occurring, but probably most of us learned about it in school, or if you read The Grapes of Wrath, you read that, that um, story about how um, tragic it was. Many, many photographs from the depression came from the area, the area of the dust, um, the dust Bowl. And you can see that not only were there big dust clouds, but there, the soil is just basically gone, okay? There's, there's really um, nothing good left. And this resulted from the use of continuous tillage and the habit, which still um, remains in the Midwest in many cases, of tilling, tilling after harvest, leaving the winters, the, the fields tilled and fallow, that is bare, over the winter. And the soil is just naked. It's just totally unprotected from erosion, which can occur by wind like this or by water. And that just um, carried so much of the soil away. Now. Um, people recognize that, you know, they've got a big problem here. And some modifications um, to uh, sort of guidelines for agriculture were made during the New Deal. For example, um, contour plowing was um, started to be recommended where farmers were, uh, were told to plow along the contours of hills rather than up and down because that just makes uh, a straight shot for erosion to carry the soil away. But even so, modern agriculture continues to damage the soil in a big way. Um, so tillage is still um, almost universal. Um, this is starting to change a little bit. Maryland is much better than other states. And um, 
Uh, so what you see in Maryland does not typify the rest of the country. Um, so most farmers are still tilling. The equipment is really heavy now and it compacts the soil, especially when farmers uh, move the equipment out into the fields after a rain or too soon after a rain. Here's um, a little mini dust storm in Kansas, uh, and a good example of wind erosion and water erosion. Um, again, taking just tons of topsoil um, off of the land um, after rains and forming these erosion gullies, which then farmers in the Midwest have to pay to repair. They have to drive across the field and, and almost grade it and repair it, which causes further compaction. Um, eroded soil looks like this. It gets very crusty. You can see the crust here. Um, and seedlings can even have a hard time coming up through it. You can see the color of this eroded soil. It's gray instead of a good rich brown. Uh, and the brown, of course, is the organic matter in the soil. So um, when you get a soil like this that has crust, instead of the water soaking in, it runs off the top. And that is sort of a positive feedback. It just takes more of the soil with it. And the water is not infiltrating into the soil anymore. And that it's that infiltration that purifies the water because passing through the soil um, cleans the water. If it runs off, it just goes straight into the waterways um, carrying sediment and whatever chemicals. So um, when you have, uh, uh, you, when you don't take care of the soil and you have a lot of erosion, you have increased runoff. There's not as much infiltration, so you have greater flood risk and the water quality is reduced. Um, now, the good news is that the USDA has really been making a push on conservation practices for soil. Um, and the, um, the, they, they are pushing them in part be, for the soil, but also because they improve water quality. And so some of the main ones, the main strategies for conservation agriculture are no-till. So here's a no-till field. And the whole idea with no-till, I'm sure most of you know, but I'll just repeat it, is basically just what it says, <laughs> don't till the soil. Um, and you can see in this field, which look, looks like it's soybeans now, here's the remnants of last year's corn crop. And a no-till planter just comes through and makes a little slice, drops the seed. Um, there's a, there's a, a really cool combination of little things on the planter. So the, uh, a little trench is opened up, the seed drops down, maybe some fertilizer is put in there, and then the, the trench is closed up. And there's no disturbance except right here where the seeds are planted. Um, this, uh, this picture shows you the next sort of really important practice, which is cover crops. And this is the um, future in, uh, incarnation of cover crops, really, which is planting the cover crops while the cash crop, um, like these soybeans, is still small, okay? So a farmer could come through here now, or even when the soybeans get up to be a foot or something like that, and with a special piece of equipment and seed a cover crop like this clover in between the rows. So here there's three rows of clover. Looks like there's some hairy vetch or something in there too, in between each row of clover, of corn. And when you see the cover crop, when the cash crop is small, there's still enough light so the cover crop can grow up and get sort of a start. Then the, the cash crop, the soybeans or the corn will get bigger and close the canopy and shade that cover crop. But that those uh, clover plants could just lurk under there during the summer. It's a little shady, so they're not growing very well, but they're not going anywhere. And then when the farmer comes through and harvests the cash crop, the sun is back, it starts to dry, that helps the sun, more sun reaches the, the crop. But when it's harvested, then the cover crop has already got you know, maybe this much growth and it can really grow fast. And for soil health purposes, what you want is a cover crop that um, doesn't just send roots down to pick up uh, um, nutrients that the cash crop didn't get. That's one of the reasons that Maryland is so good at cover crops is we encourage farmers to plant them so they will um, have a way to get the excess nutrients out of the soil or up to the top before they flow down to Chesapeake Bay. But 
the more biomass in roots and also above ground that you have in the cover crop, the better it is for soil health because the more organic matter there is. Um, so um, not too many people now are planting cover crops into the cash crop like this, but this is going to be growing because it's, um, it really works so much better. Um, particularly for weed control. This is one of my favorite pictures because it shows what I think is the wave of the future, which is here's a farmer. He is, he or she, you can't tell, has a, um, a roller crimper on the front. A roller crimper is like a drum with some sharp, they're not really sharp, but ridges along it and curve pattern that smashes down the cover crop and uh, crimps the stem so that the cover crop will die. This is rye, it looks like, which can grow over six feet. You really can't see how massive this is. And so in front of the tractor, this implement is smashing it down. And you can see here the, the, uh, the, the smashed down crimped cover crop. But behind the tractor, he's got his planter. And so um, uh, right after the cover crop is smashed down, the planting occurs right, no-till planting occurs right into the cover crop and going the same direction. So um, uh, our good ag extension agents in Maryland are um, uh, encouraging people to do, to do um, termination of cover crops and planting at the same time. Um, uh, and, and that is really a great practice. You can see down here, here's the corn that might have been planted in this way. The corn has come up at, in between, there's a thick layer of dead cover crop, which is um, uh, 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 suppressing the germination of weeds. So this is, it's, uh, this is a, a really huge benefit because not only do we not want to use herbicides as much because of um, chemical problems, but many herbicides, glyphosate is a great example, um, are no longer effective against some of the major weeds because the weeds have evolved resistance. And so uh, this use of cover crops um, like this, where you have a big biomass and you smash it down, and then you have the biomass in between suppressing the growth, uh, the germination growth of weeds. This is the wave of the future. Now it's interesting, people used cover crops for weed control a lot before glyphosate and, um, and Roundup Ready um, crops came on the horizon. And farmers have gotten very used to having a really no weed field, really perfect looking fields. Um, but as weeds have become, have evolved resistance to these, these um, herbicides, um, we're moving back in this direction. So it's sort of back to the future. No-till benefits are less erosion, you have better soil structure because you're not disturbing it. Um, the crop residue adds organic matter. The soil drains better because it has better structure and it also holds more water and the water is filtered and clean. So it has big water quality benefits, big soil health benefits. Cover crops reduce erosion. They hold the soil during the winter. The living roots feed soil microbes, which we'll be talking about more in a minute. And crop rotation is not on here, but crop rotation is really important. Um, again, uh, almost universal in Maryland, but not so in the rest of the country. Um, if you have a field like this and you grow soybeans one year or one season, corn, then maybe uh, uh, something else, alfalfa for a while, even just corn and soybean rotation is better than one thing. Um, and, and so having more different plants on this landscape, on this field over time is a benefit because it leads to a diversity of the underground microbial community and that makes it work better. So we can apply, apply some of these same ideas to gardening and landscaping, uh, which you'll be hearing about in the other two webinars in this series. So let's talk about basic soil. Um, soil is Earth's second largest ecosystem. Um, first largest is the ocean. And healthy soil performs absolutely critical ecosystem functions. So when the soil is degraded, the ecosystem functions are not working as well. Now, obviously the soil holds up the plants, <laughs> but it does way more than that. 
Um, I've already alluded to the water quality benefits of soil, um, but soil stores water, it filters the water, and it helps with water cycling. That is, it regulates the water um, and um, is really an important part of keeping the landscape sort of stable with water. Um, I'll tell you in a minute what stable soil aggregates are, but when you have healthy soil, it resists erosion. And I've already said it drains and holds water. Now, healthy soil also is crucial for what they call nutrient cycling. And that's just jargon for um, the, the process by which soil organisms, you know, some of them are multicellular like earthworms or amphipods, um, and some of them are unicellular. Soil organisms decompose dead stuff dead plant material, dead animals that drop onto it, um, dead earthworms or whatnot. And what they do during this decomposition process is basically um, uh, make available, again, for plants to take up all the nutrients that are in um, whatever it was it was living. So nitrogen and phosphorus and um, some carbon, et cetera, is released, but mostly nitrogen and phosphorus um, um, in terms of um, things that are useful for plant growth. Um, the soil provides habitat for a tremendous amount of biodiversity and healthy soil is really diverse. Now, no place is as diverse as it used to be. Uh, certainly the soil is not as diverse, even healthy soil now as under a prairie or under a forest, but um, we can have big improvements over um, what essentially is the standard issue degraded agricultural soil now. Um, when we have diversity, that is a lot of different organisms down there that are doing sort of the same thing um, functionally, that stabilizes ecosystems because it means that in different places at different times, if there's different conditions, um, some, in, some species will still be doing each function, okay? Even though maybe not all species are doing as well under um, those conditions. So diversity is really crucial to um, ecosystem stability. Now, I'm a biologist, not a soil scientist. Um, and so it really made me excited when I learned that 90% of everything that goes on in the ecosystem <laughs> is driven by soil organisms, okay? So it really is, soil is all about the biology. Um, I used to think soil was um, just, you know, how is soil formed, weathering of the rocks, etc., cetera, um, which I myself did not find that riveting, but um, it, you know, of course is riveting and is important, but um, the biology to me is what I find really, really exciting. So if we take a chunk of soil, so here's a little, a little volume a, a cartoon of soil, which organisms in there are the most abundant, okay? earthworms or protozoa or fungi or uh, little mites or what, roots, what? Well, it turns out the most abundant organisms are the microbes, okay? And not just most abundant, but if you actually pulled out all the organisms from a little cube of soil, you'd find that the weight of the microbes was probably the greatest too, even though individually they're small. Um, so, most people think of bacteria and fungi in a very negative light, like they're the things that make us sick. They're, you know, we got to get them out of our house. We, you know, whatever, don't let your kids eat the soil because it's filled with bacteria. But the truth of the matter is that um, most microbes in the soil are friendly. And um, friendly bacteria and fungi in the soil battle the unfriendly ones. Now, I've got this picture of the sort of strange looking picture of a human body. If you can see it up close, it's actually made of little microbes. But this is a cover of Scientific American from 2012. Um, and the cover story was about your inner ecosystem. And the fine print says here, in your body bacteria outnumber your own cells 10 to one. Who's in control? Well, it turns out if you talk about digestion or your immune system, really the microbes are doing all the work. And most of them are friendly, friendly microbes. And um, even on your skin, I like to think of this, but in the, in the uh, lining of your gut, it's true too. On your skin, there's tons of bacteria that are just sitting there, kind of place holding. And they are keeping pathogenic bacteria off of there. Now, you know that your skin keeps pathogenic bacteria out of your body. So 
the risk of a cut, of course, is when bacteria can get in. Uh, but they're out there all the time, and a lot of them basically are beat back by the friendly bacteria that are sitting around just taking up space. So microbes are crucial for healthy soil and for a healthy body. Um, so if we talk about soil, and just take one little teaspoon of soil like this, um, uh, it contains, one little teaspoon contains more than one billion microbes, microbial cells. And um, somebody needs to mute. Could somebody, could everybody mute, please? Um, uh, Stephanie, maybe you can do the power mute. Um, yep, I've got it, sorry. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Um, so plants are out there photosynthesizing, right? You guys are all master gardeners, so you know this. Um, they've got their leaves in the sun. They're um, taking up carbon dioxide. They're getting the energy from the sun and they're turning the carbon dioxide into sugar, okay, which is a carbon substance. And that's um, basically what plants do. And they make all this sugar and you might think they're using it to build their you know, tissues, to make leaves, stems, roots, fruits, seeds, but they give up to 40% of all that sugar they make um, at great expense to them, right? They give up um, almost half of it, up to almost half of it to soil, bacteria, and fungi. And they are not doing this to be nice, right? They're doing it because they're getting something out of it. So plants get a lot from this exchange of um, essentially sugar uh, with the um, soil microbes. They get nitrogen, water, nutrients. They get protection from diseases, even protection from predators and protection from abiotic stress like drought or salt or heat. Um, and so there's, a, there's a, well, really zillions of species of microbes that are working to help plants. Now I knew about the main kinds, nitrogen fixing bacteria. Nitrogen fixing means take nitrogen out of the air and turn it into something plants can use. And mycorrhizal fungi, and I'm going to talk in more detail about each of these um, in just a minute. But until maybe the last five years, I did not realize there were hundreds, probably thousands of species of other bacteria that are out there working for plants. And here's one of them. It's a little bit hard to see, but this material in the center, oh, brother. Okay, sorry, let's go back. Um, that sensitive mouse, if you click it, you're gone. So here we are. Here's the root tip right here, sort of in a brown rust color. And this green stuff around the outside, um, is a thick layer of bacteria that the investigator has stained so that they will fluoresce green when he, when he or she puts the, you know, puts them under, um, uh, you know, certain wavelengths of light. And so what these bacteria are doing is they're glommed on to the outside of the root. Now, yes, they are soaking up sugars that leak out of the root, but they are also providing a protective layer on that root that keeps out bad guys, bad bacteria, um, et cetera. And so again, that's just like on your skin. You've got friendly bacteria that are keeping out the bad guys. So let's talk about these two major groups for just a second. Nitrogen fixing bacteria. Um, there are many kinds. The most familiar kind of nitrogen fixing bacteria are the ones that form nodules, and those are found in legume plants. Um, it's an interaction between the plant and the bacteria. And um, if you've never done this, I really recommend it because you can learn about something in a webinar or in school, but until you actually see it, it doesn't really make an impression, at least on me. So I dug up this red clover plant <laughs> uh, before I gave this webinar the first time. Um, and I rinsed off the roots and just took this picture with my iPhone. And you can see these nodules on here, okay? And inside those nodules, here's, uh, this is from a textbook, but this is a section down through the long direction of the root. And here's the outlines of the nodules. And inside the nodules are uh, just, they're crammed full of bacteria, okay? So if I were to take a little razor blade or something under a microscope and cut down through that nodule, on this plant, they happen to be hanging off the roots. This one, they're, they're a little bit more integral. But if I cut through that nodule, I would, and I had a compound microscope, I'd be able to see the bacteria in there. So um, if you're stuck at home and you don't have anything to do, get a shovel, 
if you don't have red clover, you'll probably have some white clover. Um, or if you're growing soybeans or um, regular beans, hopefully they are, um, you inoculate them and they, and they have nodules, but dig some up. It's really cool to see them. Um, okay, so they make root nodules in, uh, in, uh, in legume plants. There are a lot of free living bacteria that also fi fix nitrogen, um, but the, you know, I don't have any pictures of those. Now, the interesting thing is the first nitrogen fixing bacteria evolved around 2 billion years ago, okay? This is not too long after photosynthesis evolved when all life was still in the ocean. And the first nitrogen fixing bacteria were our cyanobacteria. And um, they're also photosynthetic. So uh, this is a really ancient interaction, okay? Very, very ancient, and it's, it's really intricate. Now, when you're planting legumes in your garden, you can sort of uh, ensure that this interaction occurs by coating your seed with um, a powdered preparation of the right species of um, rhizobium bacteria. And so hopefully if you planted beans or something in your garden, you did provide them with some inoculum. There's the bacteria are in the soil, but they can be rare if you haven't grown any, any legumes in there for a while. So uh, always good to um, add, add these to your um, legume seed. Um, so moving on, mycorrhizae, that term is a very generic term, kind of like Kleenex, right? So Mycorrhizae are fungi that colonize plant roots. So there's a lot of different kinds of mycorrhizal fungi. Um, this is a picture, famous picture of mycorrhizae. This is a little tiny conifer seedling, okay, really small. And the sort of orangish is the root of the plant, okay, three little pieces of root. The rest of this stuff that looks like roots, not roots, mycorrhizal fungi. And the body of these fungi is made of filamentous strands called hyphae. And I'll show you in the next picture, they invade the roots on one end and park themselves in the root cells. And then the other parts of them grow out into the landscape like, like this, um, serving the same function as roots, but even better. Um, mycorrhizae, uh, help the plant take up water and nutrients, okay, by going way out away from the roots. And it's interesting, they evolved, this type of fungus evolved um, about the same time as land plants, okay. Land plants evolved around 450 million years ago. And scientists think that plants could probably not have made it on land without these mycorrhizal fungi that were symbiotic with them because the um, amount of water and nutrients that the fungi were able to bring to the plants made it easy enough for the plants to live in what is really a hostile environment com compared to uh, algae living in an ocean where they're surrounded by water, they're surrounded by, you know, sloshing around in nutrients. It's a lot harder on land where, um, you know, it, 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 there's not water and nutrients everywhere. You've got to have roots that go get them. So um, this is kind of another really interesting aspect of this interaction. As, as fundamental as, you know, um, land plants themselves, um, mycorrhizae also help plants in other ways. They fight disease, they combat plant stress, they act as predators, um, and they grow between plants, even plants of different species. And so there's a kind of underground communication network going on that's mediated by the mycorrhizal um, hyphae going in between plants. And um, there are a number of studies uh, done on this. And one is really cool. Um, the investigators um, uh, had some mycorrhizae growing um, amongst a group of tomatoes. And they, um, they caused an insect or something to damage uh, the leaves of one of the tomatoes. And they found that chemical signals were sent to other tomatoes nearby through the mycorrhizal fungi saying, turn on your defenses because there's trouble. <laughs> I've got insects on me and you're going to have them soon. So um, there's this underground communication, all chemical, of course, that is mediated by, um, by these fungi. And there was a cool article in the New Yorker, uh, maybe three or four years ago, um, that referred to these fungi as the wood wide web. Kind of terrible, but I liked it. 
Um, now, mycorrhizae require living roots. Um, after, uh, uh, let's imagine you, you uh, have a field and you harvest the plants and you go away. Well, the, some of the mycorrhizae might make it through the winter. Many of them will just retreat into their dormant stage, the spores. And the spores don't live forever, right? So um, they require, to, to be in a really active state, they require living roots that are pumping out sugar. Mycorrhizae do not live in compost. Now, there are people out there in the big world saying, put compost on your garden because it has all the microbes you need. No, it doesn't. <laughs> I'm sorry to say. And um, yeah, well, I'll just leave it there. So um, compost is really good. It provides organic material, uh, but it does not provide um, nitrogen fixing bacteria. It does not provide mycorrhizae. Okay, up to 90% of all plants have mycorrhizae, and many of the mycorrhizal fun fungus species are fairly generalized, so they will inhabit a number of different kinds of plants. Um, mycorrhizal fungi, by sending out those hyphae, increase, increase the root area of plants up to 700 times. So here's a cartoon. Here's a, a root with some root hairs on here, and there's a few bacteria, but there's no mycorrhizal fungi over here. So, um, uh, this is basically also shown here. Here's a little root hair, a little teeny root. And um, I, this, this, in, this cartoon in real life has a blue um, line surrounding this whole root. And what this is meant to illustrate is that on its own, the root can suck phosphorus out of a very small layer of soil right next to the root, okay? And once it uses the phosphorus up in that little area, well, that's it. That's all the root can do other than, you know, uh, grow off and go in another direction. That is pretty much all the root can do. However, the mycorrhizae um, in the area, and I'll tell you how they actually get into the root in a second, but they invade the root and then, um, Stend out a bunch of um, uh, tendrils inside each cell, so they get a lot of surface area inside each cell, and they soak up sugar uh, over that surface area, and they go out away from the root. Okay, like this. So this guy is mycorrhizae. Go, go way over here. Okay, and they pick up water and nitrogen and phosphorus and bring it back to the plant. That is a whole lot better than the plant can do on its own. Um, and because the mycorrhizal hyphae are out there uh, uh, obtaining water, that increases drought tolerance right off the bat for the plants. Um, this picture is a scanning electron micrograph, which shows the surface of things. And here's a root with a, some mycorrhizal fungi that are stained to look um, yellow. These are not the actual colors that people do, doing these, making these pictures um, arrange these colors so you can see them. This is a spore. These are spores and these are the hyphae. And so some of these hyphae are invading, have invaded the root, so they'll be inside the root cells. And the, you can see if you actually prepare the roots and, um, and stain them, um, you can see here's the hyphae grown in between uh, in between root cells. This is all blue. The only blue things in here are the mycorrhizae. And inside each cell, they've elaborated and, and filled the cell up with this sort of elaborate structure. And I, I have to say, I'm pretty proud of this picture. I took this myself um, because I wanted to go out um, in my yard and see if I could actually see mycorrhizae. And um, I I read this method, which I did not think would work, but it involved um, going and getting roots and rinsing them off in the sink, you know, so they didn't have soil on them. And then boiling them in vials in my crock pot for a day <laughs> in KOH, which is really harsh. Um, and, and then clearing them with hydrogen peroxide to remove the color and then staining them with pen ink. It was remarkably simple. And when I saw this picture under my microscope, I could not believe that I actually was able to do it. So you could do this too, it's pretty cool. Now, um, my crock pot has recovered from this. <laughs> I don't put KOH in my crock pot anymore, so you don't have to worry about that. Um, okay, now, the interaction between plants and either of these symbionts is really um, uh, intricate. And it involves some communication, which all occurs through chemicals. 
And so let's just talk a little bit about the nitrogen fixing bacteria. This is like a series here. So we start here. Um, here's the plant and it detects that there is not enough nitrogen in the soil. Okay, that's the first step. If there's plenty of nitrogen, the plant does not call out for the nitrogen fixing bacteria. But if the plant detects there's not enough nitrogen, it calls out by sending out chemicals, flavonoids. Okay, it doesn't matter what, what chemicals. It just says, okay, I need some nitrogen. If you guys are out there in the soil, you nitrogen fixing bacteria, come on over. I'll let you into my roots. I'll make a nodule. Life will be great. And so if there are any um, bacteria out there, uh, here they are, okay, they get the signal and they are like, yeah, okay, we really want to come over. So they emit another signal of their own, the nod factor. Again, you don't need to know what this is. But then the plant detects that, right? So the plant says, come on over. The bacteria say, okay, we're ready. And then the plant grows out this little sort of beginning of a, um, of a nodule, little projection. And there's a bunch of other stuff that goes on. And so as we go through time, then there's this little root hair and it becomes susceptible to being invaded by the bacteria. And then the bacteria invade it. So here they are lined up in there. And then eventually the plant builds this like condo for the bacteria, the nodule. And so all the green is the plant cells and the, the red are the bacteria and they are getting a place to live that's safe. They're getting sugar to feed themselves. And in return, they're using the air that is in the spaces in the soil to pull the nitrogen out of there um, nitrogen in air is two nitrogen atoms stuck together, okay, very tightly. And you got to have some mechanism to get that apart. So um, that's what the nitrogen fixing bacteria do. In fact, until the 1940s, when somebody invented the process by which they are able to make synthetic nitrogen fer fertilizer, every bit of nitrogen used by plants on Earth was obtained through nitrogen fixing bacteria. I think is kind of cool. Now here's the mycorrhizae, same kind of back and forth interaction, different chemicals, of course. So here are the mycorrhizae. I don't have enough phosphorus. I don't have enough, here's the plant, sorry. I don't have enough phosphorus or enough water. So let's see if there's anybody out there who will listen to my call. They send out this chemical signal. The, the fungi are just hanging around out there in the soil, right? They cannot get in the roots unless they have gone through this, this communication process because any foreign thing entering the roots gets glommed onto and there's a wound response and they sort of are stopped. But after this communication, plant says, come on over. Uh, the fungus says, okay, send out another signal. Then the plant allows the fungus to grow into the plant cells and it elaborate, they elaborate like this within the cells um, and start taking up sugar and giving, you know, um, water and nitrogen. Now, this is an intricate thing and it's costly. I mean, it costs the plant something to make this nodule, right? It could be making seeds or it could be making roots or something for itself. Um, it costs the plant something to let these mycorrhizae into the roots, okay, and to feed them all this sugar. So the interaction between these symbionts and plants is reduced to nothing even if there's already enough nutrients, phosphorus, water, et cetera, in the soil, okay? So that's one reason you can grow plants in sterilized potting mix, because you're giving them fertilizer, you're giving them water, you're giving them everything they need. They don't need to have these interactions in that pot. So similarly, if you put a lot of nitrogen fertilizer on your garden and you water it all the time and every life is good, then, um, you are probably not going to have plants that have a lot of interaction with these symbionts. Um, if you then stop those things, stop the water, stop the fertilizer, etc., then you have plants that don't have any symbiotic microbes and they can be in trouble. Okay, um, soil bacteria can help plants in a lot of other ways, and I'll just give a couple of examples here. These are these are the so-called plant growth promoting bacteria, the hundreds of species that are out there that aren't nitrogen fixing and they aren't the, the um, mycorrhizal fungi. These are bacteria. And um, this is a cool picture. I came across this. I thought it was just so cool. Um, Dennis Kunkel microscopy. They um, 
studied the inter and photographed the interaction between a pathogenic fungus in the green. Okay, they colorized this so you could see the difference between the species. The, the hyphal strands are here in the green. That's uh, pythium root rot. It's a pathogenic fungus. Um, and the uh, friendly soil bacterium pseudomonas in the yellow rods, okay? And it turns out that these bacteria attack the fungus and essentially keep it from attacking the roots. And so here's an experiment that was done by some investigators. And they grew up a bunch of the same kind of plants and I can't really see what they are, but um, uh, they grew them all up in the same sort of situation, same kind of soil, same amount of water, et cetera. And they um, put Pseudomonas bacteria in half of the plant, plants, half of the flats or half of the pots. And they put root rot fungus in all of the pots or all of the flats. And um, what you see here is in the flats there are the pots that got um, the pythium root rot but did not get the friendly bacteria. You can see the roots are really um, minimal. They've basically rotted away. Over here in the pots that got the bacteria and the pathogenic fungus, the roots are a lot more, you know, elaborated. There are a lot more fibers. You've got more root material in there. The bacteria protected those roots from rotting out from the pythium, which is pretty cool. Okay, this last example. Um, there are at least three species of naturally occurring bacteria in soil that protect plants from drought stress. And I'm not a plant physiologist, so I can't describe to you all the intricate stuff that goes on, but I'll just show you the outcome. So again, some investigators grew a bunch of plants, in this case, um, cucumbers. So they had you know, a bunch of seeds, they had little drink cups, they had potting mix, they set it all up to be a lot of different drink cups with the potting mix, they planted cucumbers in each one. They were all treated the same. Half of them received an inoculation with these what I, I think a mixture of three species of these soil bacteria. These guys went out and identified them and were able to inoculate these pots with them. Then here are the ones that were treated just the same as this, except they did not receive the friendly bacteria that um, protect plants from drought stress. Then the investigators went away for 13 days and nobody watered those plants, okay? So at the end of 13 days, they came back and half of them, the ones that had gotten the bacteria that protected from drought stress, looked pretty good. I think these look really pretty good. Like maybe somebody didn't water them for one day, but they're going to be perfect once you water them. These do not look so good, okay? Now, some of these leaves might bounce back if you water them. Some of them look like they're just shy of that crispy stage where you know they're not coming back. Um, and they experience the full drought stress that you get from not being watered for 13 days. These guys were protected from that because they had these friendly bacteria. So the, oh, oh there's one more example. There are other species of fungi out there that are single cell, one, just one cell, rather than um, a multicellular fungus with all those hyphy str hyphal strands. And these single cell fungi can inhabit roots, okay, or they can inhabit leaves. These happen to all be in roots. Um, and they're called endosymbiotic because the whole fungus, that whole cell lives right in the roots of the leaves. And they increase plant tolerance to insect pests, various diseases, salt, and heat. And in fact, the, um, the um, uh, turf fescue, high, uh, tall fescue for turf, much of it is bred to have these endophytes, endophytic fungi in the leaves because that reduces insect damage. And um, that's why you don't plant a lot of these um, lawn fescues in pastures because the and, uh, endo, uh, endosymbiotic fungi are bad for uh, gr uh, grazers. Anyway, so here's another fungus that's helping plants out. Okay, here's the idea. If we build up healthy soil, Naturally occurring bacteria and fungi can promote plant growth, fight pathogens, and reduce plant stress from heat, drought, etc. But if we let the soil become unhealthy and degraded and eroded and low in organic material, and we don't put living roots in the soil over the winter so that the, the microbes um, stay vital, 
then we need to add everything. We need to add synthetic nitrogen fertilizer. We need to put a lot of pesticides on, fungicides. We have to water it, okay? Now we sort of take these things for granted. This is what you know happens in agriculture. All this stuff is added. But you don't need nearly as much of this, if really any, if you build up your healthy soil. So um, Stephanie or Jean, should we stop? And, um, and take some questions right now, what do you think? Yes, there are some questions that have come in, so I think now's a great time for a break. Okay. Um, so I'll go ahead and start with the first one. Will the cover crop planting during growth of cash crops diminish weed infestation? Oh, yeah. If, um, well, let me say, um, let me back off of that just a little bit. It depends on how big those little cover crop plants get. The ones that you that I showed you, the clover from that picture from Cornell, they were pretty big, so they might crowd out some weeds. Um, but um, I don't know whether, I don't think they are planted for weed control because they may not get big enough to actually crowd out the weeds. Now they're gonna crowd them out to a certain extent, but it might not be perfect. But that's a really good question. Excellent. Um, should backyard gardens also be no-till? Um, the way they learned gardening in the past was with the addition of compost turned into the soil. Um, well, we're going to talk about gardening um, in uh, a couple of weeks. What's the mm -hmm. date of that? July uh, 10th. So mm -hmm. I'm going to give a whole webinar on gardening and I'm going to talk about no-till gardening and other stuff. So we'll just postpone that until then. Sure. Okay, could mycorrhizae presence or absence have anything to do with blossom end rot, which has to do with the plant's ability to absorb calcium from the soil? I will just say I have no idea. <laughs> I really do not know. I've never read in particular that the mycorrhizae transport calcium. Um, I think, um, you know, the people, Stephanie and the other people at HGIC, John Fraunfeld and those folks, they know the answer to that question, but I do not. Sure, it may be a great question for the Ask an Expert folks at HGIC. There you go, they know everything. <laughs> um, when would be a good time to plant the cover crops for a vegetable garden? Um, well, uh, uh, you can plant them right after you harvest. Uh, um, and of course, um, if you harvest way late in the fall, it might be too late, but um, you can plant different cover crops at different times of year. So okay. you can plant some in the spring. You can plant some in between rows. You, some people plant red clover as a, a, like a living mulch in between their rows. Um, so the answer is um, almost any time you could plant a cover crop, but most of the time people plant them after harvest. Excellent, thank you. Um, and the only other question was if this meeting will be recorded and yes, it will, um, we'll share it on the HGIC YouTube channel. And um, Jean has put the link to the Ask an Expert service from HGIC into the chat box in case anyone wanted to submit their question there. But we are going to, at this point, proceed with our presentation. All right. And more questions later on, that's all we have for now. So hopefully you guys got a little brain rest. <laughs> it can be hard to listen to somebody drone on for a long period of time, but um, uh, sometimes questions can help with that. So let's move on to the next part and ask, okay, we've been talking about healthy soil. What is healthy soil? Okay, how do you get it? First of all, what is it? Healthy soil is about 50% water and air, okay? A quarter, wa a quarter air and then a lot of water. Um, then there's a lot of mineral material, obviously, in the soil, a little bit of organic matter, okay, not that much, usually uh, two to eight percent, something like that. Ten percent organic matter would be really mm, at the upper, upper level. Um, so you definitely need the water and the air uh, uh, in the spaces between roots and soil particles. So here's a little cartoon of that. Here's a root and um, there's a little bit of organic matter. These things are like soil particles. These, they look like boulders, but they're little soil particles. And the grayish area is air. And you can see there's little mites and multicellular creatures, um, a little springtail crawling around in the air spaces, okay? So if you don't have any air spaces in the soil, all you have is water, then not only your plants are gonna be waterlogged, 
um, and things are not going to grow well at all. But you are not going to have any of these organisms that need the air. And uh, if you have any nitrogen fixing bacteria, there's no air for, not enough air, no air for them to get the nitrogen out of. So 50% water and air is really important. Um, okay. Now, the cool thing about soil is it's not just random sort of particles out there. Uh, healthy soil has a specific structure, which turns out is uh, the structure is built by the soil organisms themselves, and it, it uh, acts as their habitat. So um, here's just like another, another little cartoon. Um, you can see here part of what they call an aggregate. A soil aggregate is this structure which is built up by the organisms. And here's a root, and there's some mycorrhizal hyphae on there and some spores. And here's a little air space that looks like there's a mite in there. And if you get up even closer, you can see bacteria and, and whatnot. Um, an earthworm, and there's like organic matter stuck in little tiny places inside the, the aggregate. So this is like a super habitat for the uh, little tiny multicellular things, but also for the microbes. Soil aggregates are built up and held together, not just by roots or not just by fungal hyphae, but actually by exudates, which means stuff that is exuded from roots and from fungi. And the stuff that's exuded from roots and fungi um, is like sugary, sticky stuff, okay? Um, uh, glycoproteins, they call them. And so this material isn't living, right? It's just sugary, sticky stuff. And it sticks together these little soil particles into a structure that's pretty intricate. It has big pores, okay, and intermediate pores and little teeny pores. Water can drain through the big pores and the intermediate pores. Um, and that allows water, rainwater to infiltrate, which is very important, of course and water can be held in these little tiny pores. Um, the glue that comes out of the roots and the mycorrhizae is stable in water, it doesn't dissolve in water. And so these structures are stable in water, okay? There's some other little sticky stuff that comes from various other soil organisms, but most of it comes from roots and mycorrhizae. So because this glue is stable in water, the aggregates are stable in water and they don't fall apart if it rains, okay, they stay there and rain infiltrates through them. So the habitat for the organism stays there. It doesn't just turn into mush when it rains. Um, healthy soil reduces climate risk because it allows the infiltration of, of rainwater, okay? So it reduces the risk from increased flooding. And we know that heavy downpours are much more common now than they were in the past because of climate change. So again, in healthy soil, the aggregates are stable in water. They stay there like that with the pores in place and water can infiltrate and go through them. This is a flooded field in, um, in Eastern Maryland. And now I'm having a little senior moment. I can't remember whether it was last year, I think it was two years ago in 2018, that we had the 10 inches of rain in one week in, uh, on the Eastern shore, maybe only seven inches in Howard County, but a lot of rain and a lot of fields on the Eastern shore look like this because this rain came after corn had been planted and was already up. This picture is courtesy of Jim Lewis, who's an ag agent in Carolyn County. And I so wished that at that point I had some kind of little meter or something I could just hold out my window, drive around and say, okay, how healthy is that soil? Because <laughs> I really felt like we should be able to see the relationship between soil that was healthy and and the reduction of flooding. How, how long did this water hang around out here in this field? You know, how, how, how deep did it get, et cetera. Of course, that's partially the topography, but how long it hangs around is, is um, very closely related to how healthy the soil is. Now, I didn't have one of those little things. You know, like Star Trek, the guys wave the little implement, the little instrument over people and say, oh yeah, you know, here's what your health problem is. <laughs> I wanted that for healthy soil. But anyway, um, it would be really great if we had those data, but we unfortunately do not. 
Healthy soil also reduces climate risk from drought because we know that just like heavy rains are increasing, summer droughts are also increasing because it's hotter in the summer, but there's no more rainfall on average. So the greater temperatures suck the water out of the soil and cause moisture stress. And this is uh, actually a good picture of corn and moisture stress um, because uh, when corn doesn't have enough moisture, the leaves all roll up. Uh, to sort of uh, protect, they're not ex as exposed to the sun as if they're open, they roll up to protect themselves from water loss. Um, this is again a cartoon, I just put these little blue dots on here to illustrate that water can be held tightly in these small pores. So even after a big rain, a lot of water will flow through, but some water is retained, okay, in these um, little pores and that reduces the risk um, um, from drought. So scientists who work with farmers and who study agriculture and climate change have concluded that soil health is the top, quote, no regret strategy for climate resilience. No regrets meaning you want to do it anyway. You want to have healthy soil anyway because it's going to help your plants. It's going to um, increase your bottom line. It's just going to be good for the whole operation. And by the way, it also protects you from climate change. So um, all around is just a really good thing in agriculture to have healthy soil and in your garden also. So here's how we see the difference between healthy soil. First of all, let's look at these two pictures. Um, I took these. Uh, this one is in a meadow across the street from my house that's owned by the Board of Education of Howard County. And they were going to build something on there and then um, didn't. So. Um, and it's been sitting there for many, many years, decades, and all they do is mow it a couple times a year. So you've got this dense grass out there and there's milkweeds and other stuff, but the, um, uh, there's dead vegetation you know, that's thick, four or five inches, and um, lots of roots and everything. So the soil is really great under there. And so here, this is a cartoon from another book, but in really healthy soil, the water goes between infiltrates uh, through and between the aggregates. Now, this was on my property after I allowed a little bit of my pasture to get uh, seriously overgraded, overgrazed because I didn't know what I was doing and I didn't think, I didn't know much about soil at that time and um, I didn't think about erosion um, until I saw the roots of my trees like sticking up out of the soil. I thought, mm, this is not good. Um, but this soil has a very you know light color and it, the water just runs right off of it. It doesn't, it, um, it doesn't infiltrate at all. And this is a cartoon of that. So here we have these very fine particles left on the top. It's a crust. And when it rains, the water just runs right off, just making it 100 times worse. Now, I'm happy to tell you that I have remediated this by, um, ha by planting clover on it for three years. And now it looks a whole lot better than this. Um, so it's not just hanging out in my yard looking awful and being unhealthy. Anyway, if you take chunks of soil, so you take a shovel out and you dig a, a bunch of soil, a shovel full of soil up in each of these habitats and then take it in and dry it. Then you can perform uh, one of the classic soil health demos that soil health people do. And it is really simple. It just involves taking your chunk of dry, you can even use it with wet soil, but it works better with dry. Take your chunk of dry soil and put it in, these containers are maybe like, I don't know, 15 inches tall. And there's a piece of hardware cloth or screening, metal screening that you shape so it holds your piece of soil in the water. And you can take the piece from here and put it in the water and it'll basically just sit there. And you can take a chunk from here and put it on that screen and immediately it will start to fall apart and sediment will just rain down on the bottom because there is no soil structure in here. There is nothing that is holding any aggregates together. It's just all um, all gone. And so you wind up with just these soil particles uh, falling apart. There's no none of that glue that's stabilizing anything. But I've given this demo in talks and um, in workshops, say, when I give a talk. And, and then we move it over to the side while the rest of the speakers are speaking in the morning. And then like two or three hours later, we go back over to it. And this one 
looks just like this. Nothing has happened. Okay, maybe there's a few clods that fell off when, out of the outside when you first put it in there. But this one will just be a little speck of mud up here left in the in the screen and the rest of it down there. So if you have a field like this, where is all that sediment going? Right down to Chesapeake Bay, causing all kinds of trouble down there. So the healthy soil protects your water quality by allowing infiltration so that water can be purified. And preventing the wholesale runoff of a bunch of sediment and it helps you con to control storm water so it's really important okay now if you have bad soil what can you do to help it and people ask me this all the time one of the top questions i get is what can i put on my soil to make it healthy and i'll just give you a real quick answer to that nothing there is nothing you can add to soil that will make it healthy what you have to do is the old fashioned way, mimic nature. So soil organisms know how to build soil. You just gotta let them do it, right? So limit disturbance and inputs, keep the soil covered, increase diversity, rotate your crops and maintain live roots all year. These are the four sacred principles of the Natural Resources Conservation Service. And if you do these things over a period of time, you'll have healthy soil. So here they are, uh, the NRCS principles, and they go around and, and teach farmers. There, there are a lot of NRCS employees go out and work with farmers all the time. Um, and they teach the farmers, keep those living roots out there, uh, maximize biodiversity in your plants, um, maximize cover of the soil, keep something on the soil and minimize disturbance. And they just say, this is what you should do. But um, this uh, NRCS um, 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 person, Dennis Chessman from NRCS Kentucky, put out this drawing, which I thought was really great. And in a um, uh, talk he gave with this drawing in there, he described that the reason that these soil principles work is because they help the soil organisms. They either feed and diversify them, living roots feed them in the winter, plant biodiversity diversifies them. Biota just means organisms. Or they protect them. If you minimize disturbance by not tilling, you protect those soil aggregates and the organic matter. If you leave the soil covered, same thing. And so I emailed him and asked him, could I use these, the slide in and, and, and talks? And we had a little email exchange. And he said to me, that in he's been working for NRCS for decades and he said nothing in his experience has engaged the farmers as much as um, as sort of understanding why these soil health principles and understanding the microbial action in the soil which I thought was pretty great okay let's see Okay, limit disturbance. We're just gonna go through these principles and give some examples. Limit disturbance, that means stop tilling. So here's a typical tilled field. And you can see the soil is just out there. It's so vulnerable, wind, water, everything can come and basically take it away. Also, tilling um, breaks up those soil aggregates. So maybe some of you know Nevin Dawson, who's an extension agent in, um, Caroline County, and he does a lot of soil health, but he described it in a way I really like. He said, tilling is like running a bulldozer through your house. So you have your house, it has rooms, it has corridors, it has a structure. You put the, send the bulldozer guys through there. And at the end of the day, you have rubble, bricks and stuff just laying around in no order. That's what tillage does. It breaks up the soil structure and leaves you essentially with the soil equivalent of rubble. Um, it destroys that habitat for organisms. It um, increases runoff and erosion, water and nutrients, et cetera. So it increases water and wind erosion. But it also um, exposes organic matter that was protected in those aggregates. I think I showed you some hiding in those little places break those up, that organic matter is now exposed, the microbes can get it and eat it, basically decompose it. And that organic material contains a lot of carbon that could be stored in soil, but if you are constantly um, disrupting the soil, the uh, essentially the microbes wind up eating it, decomposing it and eating it. And, and some people call that aerobic erosion. You're exposing that organic matter to the air. The microbes can 
digest it. So if you till your garden, for example, what you are doing is working in exact opposition to all the compost or organic material you've been adding because you're allowing the microbes to decom decompose it. Um, it's important to limit physical disturbance, um, especially compaction. Um, the machinery that people use to, um, to, in farming can be really big and really heavy. And this is a kind of cool picture that shows that some of these big pieces of equipment can compact the soil over two feet. Now, what does that mean when you compact the soil? So you've got soil particles, water, and air. If you compact the soil, what are you going to compact? Well, you can't compact the particles and you're not going to compress the water. So you're going to basically um, remove the air spaces or make the air spaces smaller. So this is non-compacted soil. This is compacted soil. Many fewer air spaces, which means you're really sort of wrecking, crushing the soil habitat. Now, any of you who live in Larryland farms, they just had strawberry season kind of limited, I think, because of the virus this year. But usually there are hordes of people out there in their strawberry fields, up and down, up and down, up and down. And they actually get a lot of compaction between the rows by people walking. So Lynn Moore, who um, is the, the one, of, one of the Moore family owners, and also um, um, I, I think she's, she directs the operation out there. She told me that they planted tillage radishes in between the rows in the fall to reduce that compaction and kind of get things back to normal. So here's a tillage radish picture from Ray Weil. Thank you, Ray. Um, and you might think that the business end for compaction wise is the radish itself. It's like a daikon radish, but actually the, uh, the business of decompacting the soil is done by this taproot, which can go down, you know, six or seven feet. And then, um, after the radish dies, uh, that taproot, um, deteriorates and you got a little channel down through there. Okay. So that allows more organic material to filter down and just sort of decompacts the soil without without the illusion of decompaction you get by tilling. People think tilling fluffs up the soil, but which it does for like five minutes until it rains and then it all goes back again. Um, use chemicals and fertilizers judiciously. That's also a way of reducing disturbance. Um, fertilizer, as I said, can limit microbial action. Too much phosphorus depresses the mycorrhizae. Too much nitrogen inhibits the nitrogen fixers. Too much nitrogen application like this, the synthetic nitrogen, leads to nitrous oxide emissions. And nitrous oxide is a super potent greenhouse gas, 300 times more potent than carbon dioxide. And producing this bag of 2020 synthetic fertilizer is very energy intensive. It has a huge carbon footprint because you have to um, heat stuff up uh, in order to get the carbon dioxide out of the air. You have to heat stuff up with by burning natural gas, very hot. And so a big carbon footprint. And um, anytime you go to one of the big stores, Lowe's, Home Depot or, or something, just ponder for a second the real estate in there they devote to lawn chemicals and fertilizer. And it really you know, kind of gets you sucked in. We'll talk about that more in regenerative landscaping. Um, chemicals and other additives, the impacts of the of herbicide and um, et cetera on microbes and the microbial community is still uncertain, okay? There's been some research, some showing that there are changes, but it's very difficult to know whether the function of the commu microbial community has changed. And also, organically approved products for pest control also affect the microbial community. Because after all, you're putting on these organic um, products to kill stuff. And so when it drips down in the soil, no surprise, it might, it, and it does affect the microbes as well. So this is not an easy issue, okay? Um, so even uh, organic approved additives can have an impact. And it's important to just limit the flow of the stuff into waterways. Keep the soil covered to prevent rain and wind erosion. This famous picture of a, a water droplet um, is just meant to illustrate that rain hits the soil really hard. And then of course, when you have water moving across the soil, it's very powerful, creating these um, gullies, as I showed you before. And you can keep the soil covered with plant residue, okay, the leftovers of the cash crop, or even better, you can cover the soil with cover crops. 
increased plant diversity with crop rotation and cover crop mixtures. This is a um, one crop rotation strategy where they have strips planted to different stuff. And then this year, this strip is in, I don't know what, soybeans or something. And then next year, soybeans will be here and whatever is here will be there and they just move it along. Um, and that way, each little piece of, gra of ground sees different plants. Um, crop rotation um, is really important for disease control and pest management as well, and also for nutrient management because you can have plants that pull excess nutri nutrients from leftover fertilize out, fertilizer out of the soil, or you can have nitrogen fixing plants that put fertilizer into the soil. Um, the more plant diversity, either through crop rotation or through planting cover crops that are mixtures of different species, I haven't really tested, gone in there, but it's really great to plant several different species together. More plant diversity, more microbial diversity, healthier microbial community. Maintain live roots to feed those microbes. So roots exude sugar and proteins, as I said, that feed the microbes. A lot of that comes right out the root tip. Some of the sugar goes out fungal hyphae, so this is that. Then you can get carbon in the soil by dead cells and some other stuff. Um, but if there's no live roots over the winter putting out the sugar, then that's hard on the microbial populations. They can decrease. They don't die right away, but they can, you know, become, go dormant and become less vigorous than they would be if they had roots to eat. Um, this is a cool picture um, where, again, the investigator has stained the bacteria, purple in this case. This is a root, and it, the root is gushing out sugar at the tip. Um, uh, and proteinaceous stuff also. And the bacteria just glommed on there. And you can see that they're using that resource. Um, winter cover crops are per preferred over crop residue for keeping the soil covered as, as we talked about before because of the living roots thing. And again, more diverse and healthier microbes means better plants and more carbon sequestered. Okay, how do you know if your soil is healthy? Well, one thing you can do is go out in your field if you're a farmer, in your yard if you're a gardener, and do the DIY quick check of your soil with the Maryland Soil Health Card, which you can get online. Just Google Maryland Soil Health Card. And it's very qualitative, but you can get a pretty good idea. So the first thing is you take a shovel full of soil and you say, okay, do I see any earthworms? Um, and if you don't see any earthworms, so here's poor soil, medium soil, good soil. Poor soil is going to have zero to one earthworms and a shovel full. And you're not going to see on top of the soil like earthworm uh, casts from, um, uh, from the earthworms or holes and stuff. Medium, two to 10, good, 10 or more, just tons of stuff um, in your soil. Organic matter color. So there you've got your shovel full of soil. What color is it? The topsoil color is similar to the subsoil color that is pale, clay looking or grayish poor soil. The, if the, um, the soil in your shovel looks, you know, close to the subsoil color, but not at exactly, then it's medium, okay? Or if the topsoil is clearly defined, you can take a shovel full and you see a layer of very dark soil and then you see clay or whatever, then you, you have some good soil on the top. Organic matter roots and residue. If you take a shovel full of really terrible soil, you will not see any visible um, uh, plant residue or roots. It'll just look like nothing, okay? Um, if you have medium soil, some residue and a few roots. If you have good soil, you'll see all kinds of stuff in there, roots and pieces of uh, plant material and stuff. It's really obvious, okay? If your soil is compacted, you can put in a little wire pin flag, um, uh, like the ones you see on the roadside sometimes, just a little piece of wire, you can stick it down in there. If you can't get that wire in there or it bends, then it means your soil is compacted, right? If the flag goes in easily, it means no problem. Soil tilth, I never really remember what that means, but it's just sort of soil goodness. Melanous, friability, this is just like uh, sort of uh, uh, how great is your soil. Um, if your soil looks dead like a brick <laughs> or like concrete, you know it's not very healthy. Somewhat cloudy, medium. Soil crumbles well. You can slice through it with a knife. It's spongy when you walk on it. It's a little, you have to be pretty sensitive to feel spongy when you walk on it. But uh, you can, if it crumbles, you're in good shape. Okay. 
anybody who's ever been out in the garden can distinguish the things in this column from the things in this column. And you can, you know, carry on down. You can look at erosion. You can look at how long it takes for water to get out of your garden. Um, and in July 15th, oh, I'm sorry, this is a different one. The third webinar in the series, this is the wrong date here for you guys, um, is about suburban landscapes and how you can improve the soil in the suburbs. Um, so if you take the time and effort to do some of these um, soil improvement techniques, they have multiple co-benefits most of the time. You're not just getting soil health, um, you're getting a lot of other good stuff. So let's just look at what cover crops will do for you if you plant cover crops. If you plant a mix, it'll increase microbial diversity. But cover crops, different cover crops, can be used to, for pest management. Some cover crops, the roots exude stuff that suppresses nematodes. Some suppress pathogens. All of them suppress weeds. Cover crops help the, this is mostly water, by reducing the leaching of nitrogen from fertilizer, reducing erosion, and reducing runoff and sediment going into waterways. Cover crops increase soil organic matter. This improves plant growth. It improves nutrient cycling. It increases soil organisms, and it helps buffer the soil that, from acid base. So that's good. And finally, cover crops help soil structure, which sequesters carbon, st oops, stores carbon in the soil. Uh oh, sorry, stores carbon in the soil. It improves aggregation, which means it improves the aeration of the soil and it improves the infiltration of water. So, one practice does all of these things, including major water quality benefits. And it's the water quality benefits that caused the state of Maryland to start to incentivize farmers to plant cover crops. I don't remember exactly when, but they've been doing it for a couple of decades. And this has resulted in Maryland being the state in which farmers plant more cover crops than any other state. About 50% of uh, corn and soybean acres in Maryland have cover crops on them in the winter. And that's because the roots of those cover crops go down, they suck up that nitrogen that was not taken up by the cash crop this summer before, and they bring that back up to the surface in the form of the cover crop plant. And that keeps that nitrogen from going down to Chesapeake Bay and causing a big dead zone. It controls erosion and keeps the sediment from going down there. So Maryland has invested heavily in that and still only about 50% of eligible acres for cover crops have cover crops. Almost no commercial, commercial vegetable production uses cover crops. So there's a lot of erosion and soil damage in commercial vegetable production. Um, um, No-till. Maryland farmers, corn and soybean farmers, about 70 to 75 percent of them use no-till. But that still means there's room for 25 percent more to use no-till. So if you compare that, however, to the Midwest, in the Midwest, about 5% of farmers plant cover crops. About 20% of farmers use no-till. Most farmers are tilling after harvest. They even fertilize after harvest in the Midwest. And then they leave those fields naked with the fertilizer on them all winter. What happens? Well, wind erosion, water erosion, runoff of the fertilizer. So that's not good. That just goes right down the Mississippi and creates the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico. So people are starting to realize that now and, and, and curb it. But for many, many years, people in Louisiana did not realize that their problems were coming from a Midwest agriculture. Okay, finally, I wanna just end by, um, I really used my time here. I'm terrible. If you tell me I have a lot of time, I'll just rattle on. But just to end here, I want to say that healthy soils fight carbon, climate change by storing carbon in the soil. Um, a, a shocking amount of carbon that had been stored in the soil in prehistoric times, pre-industrial times, is gone because of the process of tillage. And so cl so-called climate smart agriculture can um, use practices that uh, keeps the carbon in the soil and adds to it. So conventional practice, you get about as much carbon dioxide released as taken up by plants. You get a lot of nitrous oxide N2O released. In climate smart agriculture, you still get some nitrous oxide released, but less, and you get more carbon taken up than is released. And in order to do that, you want, here are some practices you can use. You can use plants with deeper roots. 
In fact, plant breeders are breeding plants to have deeper roots right now, even as we speak, um, because that helps with water uptake and nutrient uptake. So it helps um, uh, agriculture be more sustainable, but it also helps store carbon, reduce that fertilizer use. Um, this is very important and there are a number of initiatives for that. That sort of goes with nutrient management. Cover crops, agroforestry means plant trees on agricultural land. You can do what's called alley cropping where you plant rows of trees and grow crops in between. You can do silvopasture, which is you plant trees in pasture and then your grazing animals can go get the shade from the trees. But trees store a lot of carbon improve your crop rotation, add manure and other organic amendments like compost. Biochar, I personally think biochar is not ready for prime time, but it is a concept that would store, store carbon. And land restoration. Most of the carbon that we have lost is because the land has been converted from forest to agriculture and then from agriculture to development. And that's a whole nother layer of wrecking the soil. Um, this is a great paper. If any of you are scientifically inclined, just email me and I'll be happy to send you a copy. Okay, that's all I've got for today. Um, I just want to say that you can contact me anytime with questions or comments and I'd be really happy to um, hear from you. And actually, I forgot to send Stephanie a survey, but I did um, come up with a survey to um, get some comments and evaluation of the webinar. And um, Stephanie, maybe I can send that to you and you can mail that out. I would be so grateful to any of you who fill out the survey because it gives me feedback on um, what I did right, what I did wrong, what you would have liked to have seen, et cetera. And um, I, I would really be grateful if you would do that, but we can do yeah. questions now. Absolutely. Yeah, we will send out the survey in our follow up email to everybody and we'll include the link to the survey, the link to the presentation that you gave for us, as well as the link to the recording when we get this posted on HGIC's YouTube Great. channel in case you guys wanted to watch it later. So that's perfect. We will definitely do that. Um, so we did have a couple more questions come in. So I'll scroll back to where we stopped last time. All right, so our first one is, how do you maximize biodiversity in soil and grass mixtures? Well, mixtures <laughs> is the, the first word. Use a mixture of different grass species. And you can put stuff in, you can put one thing I really like adding to grass mixtures for like lawn, I think is what you must be talking about. Um, if you're talking about grass mix mixtures for lawn, you can add a clover, which is really great and fixes nitrogen and means you don't have to put fertilizer on. But we're going to be talking that to death in the third webinar, regenerative landscaping. Um, if you're talking about pastures, then you can plant mixes of grasses and legumes in pastures too. And that is, you know, is great for biodiversity. Excellent. Wonderful. Okay, our next question is, what cover crops do you recommend for a vegetable garden? Vetch seems to allow earlier spring planting, but it can be invasive. Um, I was uh, doing a little homework on this and um, I found a website. I can't remember, uh, I can't remember the origin of this website, but uh, they go through a list of different cover crops. When you can plant them, do you plant them in the fall and the spring? What are their attributes? What are their problems? And I'll find this and send it to Stephanie and maybe she can send yeah. the link out to it. Yeah, we can include that in the email. Afterwards. It's a sort of art form, honestly, figuring out the right cover crop for your need. So it's not like sure. I can say, hey, use X. It depends on, you know, it depends. Sure. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, we have someone who found fungi in their soil when they were planting perennials. Are those mushrooms or microbes? Uh, yes. Um, <laughs> mushrooms are the reproductive structure of um, uh, underground fungi, right? So when you see the mushrooms, like um, a bunch of them came up in my yard, but if you're in the forest and you see mushrooms, for example, it means that there are fungi underneath the ground. Um, so the mushrooms have the, carry the spores of reproductive structures. So they are microbes, but they, fungi, those kind of fungi are multicellular. So uh, they're kind of <laughs> in both worlds. Um, did that answer the question? It was, yes. are, they, yeah, are they microbes or mushrooms or something? Yes. But yeah, <laughs> yeah that's, what I'm for. that's good. Um, do cover crops interplanted with vegetables compete for water and nutrients? Um, mean if you plant them right in the row with your vegetables? Mm -hmm. uh, well, yeah, I would guess they would be. Um, 
And um, there is a faculty member in my department, the entomology department at um, University of Maryland in College Park, who is actively researching cover crops and vegetable production, organic vegetable production. Oh, cool. And he, um, I'll probably show some pictures from his work in the gardening talk, but he, they, they do a lot of research. He and his grad students and postdocs uh -huh. do a lot of research down at Upper Marlboro at the, um, the, the uh, like, um, the Eastern Shore equivalent of the of Simrec, the yes, uh, yeah, the research education center. and research center, yeah. and mm -hmm. um, and they have been researching um, living mulch, like using red clover, uh, in the rows and between the rows, and you know the benefits of um, of uh, uh, fixing nitrogen and keeping the soil cool and keeping weeds down. Uh, I mean, a legume like clover, if it's fix adding nitrogen, then that at least helps from the competition for the nutrients thing, um, although it does use water. But if you've got the soil covered with a cover crop um, or with mulch, living or dead mulch, then that prevents um, evaporation. So that really helps with the water thing too. So um, that's a very cutting edge question. You are like ready for... Um, great things in your garden if you're thinking that way. <laughs> Excellent. All right, so next question. Um, doesn't no-till farming require the application of herbicides to kill off the weeds? Yep. And um, in, uh, in, unless farmers have one of those roller crimpers and those are, you know, gaining in popularity even among non-organic farmers, um, again, because of the, um, the problem with weed resistance to um, the common herbicides. And um, I put this in the category of nothing is perfect. Okay, nothing is perfect. You're going to have weeds out there and you got to get rid of them somehow. And so farmers are, I think, on the cusp of transitioning to using more cover crops for weed control. A lot of them have reduced the amount of herbicide they use because they use cover crops. But we're not quite there where you could say you can't use any herbicide. And um, a, a lot of people I know want to say that, but that is not going to work right now. You, uh, you can't say that because you can't grow crops in the way that we grow crops right now if you don't have some kind of herbicide. I'm not saying I love herbicide. I'm just saying that nothing is perfect. Right. Absolutely. I think we have a lot of those situations, but we are, I think, always actively improving to make it better. So that makes sense. Yeah. Um, the next question is, what is biochar? Biochar is like wood that has been treated by a process called pyrolysis, which means you heat it way up, but it doesn't have a lot of oxygen. And so it's like charcoal. And um, there's a... Uh, there's a whole interesting history which has sort of caused biochar to have kind of mystical properties, honestly. It was used, uh, I'm gonna get this wrong, but, but um, uh, I will tell you right now, I, I, I can't probably give you a real accurate rendition, but I think it was used by native Indians in South America um, in their fields and, um, and um, it produced a, a, a reputedly really great plant growth. And there is some information that if you put this essentially charcoal down in the soil, that first of all, it's um, the carbon that's in the in that charcoal is very rec recalcitrant to, to being lost, so it sort of stays there. So that's a good thing. But even more than that, the the idea that these people are trying to get across is that that charcoal material is really uh, in, uh, sort of encourages the growth of mycorrhizal fungi. Now, I'm less sure about that. I'm not a biochar expert. Um, I researched it. I spent the last two years working with MDA on a, a, a literature review, a review of the scientific literature for carbon sequestration in agriculture. And I learned enough about biochar to realize that it is promising but not ready for prime time right now because it takes a lot of energy to make the biochar so the whole life cycle issue and um, I'm not sure that the benefits for the microbes have really been documented so it's kind of like yeah it might be good but 
Um, there are a lot of websites that'll, that pro, sort of propose to teach you how to make biochar in your backyard in in 55 gallon drums that you set on fire. But I do not think that is a good idea. <laughs> so you did not hear from me that you should set 55 gallon drums on fire in your yard because people Excellent. burned up their house that way. Yeah, probably good advice. <laughs> Okay, um, so should we be using different cover crops each year? Oh, like crop rotation of cover crops. Hmm. Um, I don't really know the answer to that. I, um, again, I'm not a cover crop expert. And as many of you know, I'm not even a master gardener. So, um, <laughs> uh, uh, so I think what I've read seems to suggest that you mostly choose the cover crop for the situation. Okay. Um, and because uh, almost by definition, a cover crop is coming in between some other crops, you've already got some crop rotation going. So um, you might choose the cover crop to be a legume or not, depending on whether you want to add nitrogen to the soil. But I don't think you have, uh, I have not heard of people wanting to rotate cover crops per se. Got it. Okay. And I've got one more, unless one comes in while this is getting answered. Are cover crops short-lived and will they die on their own or do they get turned in while they are alive? That is a really good question. <laughs> um, some cover crops in some parts of the country um, obligingly die over the winter. Um, tillage radishes die during most winters in Maryland because they can't, they're, they're not um, able to make it through the cold. However, winters are getting warmer and so they don't always die. Um, so, uh, in the literature on cover crops, you know, where they describe the attributes of different cover crops and different, um, situations where you might want to use them, uh, depending on your part of the country, you can find cover crops that will die over the winter. Other crop cover crops won't. And then the question is, what do you do with them in the spring? Well, um, you can spray herbicide. Probably most of us don't want to do that. Um, you can, uh, my favorite thing in the garden, and we'll talk about this in the gardening one, is is mow it, okay? Weed whack it as low as you possibly can get it, and then, you know, do whatever else you can do to basically terminate it without having to put any herbicide on it. We, we'll talk yeah. about that next time in the gardening one. That makes sense. And I know that um, John Tronfeld, who I think most of our folks know, has been doing a couple experiments in his own vegetable garden with just weed whacking it and letting it lie and planting right after he's weed whacked it. And I think it worked out well for him last year. If your cover crop gets really big over the winter mm -hmm. and you have a mulching mower, you weed whack it and let it lie, then you've got a thick layer of you know, mulch and you can just separate that and plant right into it and that's great. Um, uh, it depends on, again, what you planted, how big it is, how much biomass there is, whether it died, you know, it, it depends. So. Yeah, absolutely. Great. Okay. Well, that's the last question that we got. So I am going to go ahead and stop the recording. Okay.